Amazon in two more minutes to get the service done. Good morning and welcome. People are slowly coming in. Our street is closed, so if you parked in the no parking, please go move it because it probably will get towed or at least ticketed. And uh, I'm sure nobody wants that today. Uh, once again, I say welcome and I pray that you've had a blessed week. And as you've come to the house of the Lord this morning, Forget whatever is in the past. Forget what's to come after this service. But focus on the reason why you came to worship the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. Let him fill us this morning. And those of you who will be watching or watching live stream at this time, welcome. And I too pray that God would indeed bless you as you uh, worship with us and that you will sense his presence in a wonderful way. Our call to worship is found in Psalm 99. The Lord reigns, let the nations tremble. He sits enthroned between the cherubim, let the hurt shake. Great is the Lord in Zion, he is exalted over all the nations. Let them praise your great and awesome name. He is holy. The king is mighty. He loves justice. You have done what, it, what is great and just. Exalt the Lord our God and worship at his footstool. He is holy. And this morning, our opening song is song, found, the words are, How majestic is your name, O oh Lord, O oh Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name. O oh Lord, we praise your name. We magnify your name, Prince of Peace, mighty God. O oh Lord, God Almighty. Let's stand together and let's worship the Lord God Almighty.
O oh Lord God Almighty, we worship you this morning. We come into your presence. We come boldly because that's what you've asked us to do, to come boldly before your throne of grace and to make our wants, our wishes, our petitions known to you. And Lord, as we come into your presence, I pray that in a special way that you would move by your Holy Spirit upon each one of us. And Lord, we thank you because we know that you've been with us in the past. We know that you have protected us, you've kept us safe. And Lord, we give you thanks for that. And you've provided for us. And Lord, we know that you will do the same in the days that lie ahead because you are the God that's the same yesterday, today, and forever. Lord, uh, I pray for each family that's represented here this morning. And Lord, you see the different families, you know the different circumstances, you know the situations of each family, you know what concerns them this morning. And I pray, Lord, that in a special way that each family would trust you and that we would uh, cast all of our cares upon you because you are a God who cares for each one of us. And Lord, if we do have anxieties or worries or concerns, Lord, help us daily to trust you more, to cast the burdens each day, burdens that's too heavy for us to carry. Lord, help us to trust us, to trust you. And help us, Lord, to be reminded of this, that we do not need to carry any of burdens because you are the great burden bearer. Lord, I pray that you will bless this service. Lord, I pray that you would uh, bless the, your word that will be brought to us a little later, that you would strengthen uh, Captain Justin. And Lord, that indeed when he opens his mouth, that it would be words from you. And Lord, this morning I also pray for the young people. Lord, I, I pray that as they take the summer to relax or to work, whatever they may find themselves doing, that your hand of protection would cover each one of them. Lord, that you would not allow anything to arm them. And Lord, I pray that they would know that the love of Jesus is with them day after day. And Lord, as I pray for the young people, I think of our camp camping season. And Lord, I pray for this division as our day camp starts uh, tomorrow. Lord, as the young people have uh, studied, as they have reviewed, as they have looked at your word, uh, I pray, Lord, that when they meet the young people, the children tomorrow, that indeed what they have done will come back to their remembrance and that they would present your word through song, through scripture, through crafts and activities, whatever it might be. Lord, that you would bless the children and then they would take that home to their families. And Lord, that we would have the joy of knowing that young people and families have been one for your kingdom. Lord, I pray for the leaders of these camp, not only in this division, but all throughout uh, Canada, Lord, as people gather, that you would indeed strengthen them, and may they realize that what they do is for you and your kingdom. Lord, once again, I ask that you bless our service. For this I ask in your name, amen and amen. You may be seated. morning it's great to be back with you uh this week and uh as i come up to share just a few announcements want to say thank you to uh colonel gilbert who's not here but hopefully he'll watch this later and hear this uh for leading and taking part in our service last week um it was great to have the time away and we were able to tune in and watch and what a time of worship that it was just a few announcements for you um this would be the time where we would usually pass around the plates in the room 
we will not be doing that but there is a box at the back if you'd like to contribute to the ministries here at Montreal Citadel and one that I want to share with you a bit so there was a few of us that came down yesterday with the family services and uh, if you'd been by the nursery in the building over the last few weeks you would have smelled um, the smell of new rubber um, because there were a bunch of bikes 30 bikes and 12 uh, scooters that were donated by an organization here in the city to the Salvation Army for us to give out and so we had the privilege yesterday of handing out those bikes and uh, what a a blessed time it was to be here and just to see um, little faces light up as they got a brand new bike and, and they to think about the possibilities and the opportunities that will be theirs as they ride those bikes and enjoy that time outside and hopefully with friends and all of those things from that and so we want to say a huge thank you to uh, to Beatrice and to Nancy to Major Florence and Elizabeth for uh, the work that was done for that a uh, reminder today that the Sunday school program starting today um, will be following the, uh, the ready to serve the, the, the junior soldiers curriculum. And so the kids, when they go upstairs, will be hearing all about the Bible, but learning a little bit about the Salvation Army as well. And important for us to share who we are and what we believe and, and, and all of those things uh, with our young people. Uh, today, following the service... Uh, it will be the Cyclovia, the street event. So there will be a time of fellowship upstairs for those who are here in the room. Um, but also there will be things, activities going on out front. Our band will be playing for about a half an hour or so at one o'clock. Um, we have a giant, I think it's an obstacle course. It could be a bouncy castle. I'm not sure. Some giant inflatable thing down the hallway that we'll be setting up outside. And so there will be that and a number of other things. And so we invite you to stay, encourage you to stay and to join in with members of our community as we uh, enjoy a good time following this service this morning. Uh, scheduling wise, there's Stitch and Chat on Tuesday at one o'clock if you would like to come and to join the ladies and then our activities again next Sunday. Uh, we thank you for joining with us here in person, for tuning in online. We'd love to see you come and join with us uh, next week or the weeks after that. And now I'm going to invite uh, the worship team to come and to continue leading us in worship this morning. Good morning. Um, it's another privilege and opportunity to be here in the presence of God with the people of God. Um, and I invite you to stand with us as we um, worship our God, worship the, our God of love. As God is love, he's poured out his love through his son, Jesus Christ, and in his life, his death, and his resurrection, we can live out that love to those around us. So let's worship together.
next song, it's a new one, um, but it talks about our worship. And worship shouldn't be just what we do in these four walls on a Sunday morning in the hour, hour and a half that we spend here. Worship should be a part of our day-to-day lives. Everything that we do is meant to glorify God. And so as we sing this next song, I pray that you would worship God for his love that does not only exist in this room, but in everywhere we go each and every day.
of our praise you are worthy of our worship and God as we continue in, in this time as as the body of Christ as a family of God may we continue to worship you and everything that is said everything that is sung everything that is played and Lord may your name and your name alone be glorified I pray all these things in your name amen thank you Good morning. So we are reading uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 13. Okay, 1 Corinthians chapter 13. And it's known as a love chapter. Okay, let's start. If I speak in the tongues of men and of angels, but have not love. I am only a resounding gong or a clanging cymbal. If I have the gift of prophecy and can fathom all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have a faith that can move mountains, but have not love, I am nothing. If I give all I possess to the poor and surrender my body to the flames, but have not love, I gain nothing. Love is patient, love is kind. It does not envy, it does not boast, and it is not proud. It is not rude, and it is not self-seeking. It is not easily angered, and it keeps no record of wrongs. Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. It always protects, always trusts, always hopes, and always perseveres. Love never fails, but where there are prophecies, they will cease. Where there are tongues, they will be stilled. Where there is knowledge, it will pass away. For we know in part, and we prophesy, uh, pro and we prophesy, thought, prophesy in, in part, but when perfection comes, the imperfect disappears. When I was a child, I talked like a child, I thought like a child, and I reasoned like a child. But when I became a man, I put away childish ways behind me. Now we see but a poor reflection as in a mirror. Then we shall see face to face. Now I know in part then I shall know fully, even as I am fully known. And now these three remain, faith, hope, and love. But the greatest of these is love. May the Lord bless his word. días, hoy leeremos Primera de Corintios 13. Si yo hablase lenguas humanas y angélicas y no tengo amor, vengo a ser como metal que resuena o símbolo que retiñe. Y si tuviese profecía y entendiese todos los misterios y toda ciencia, y si tuviese toda la fe, de tal manera que trasladase los montes y no tengo amor, nada soy. Y si repartiese todos mis bienes para dar de comer a los pobres, y si entregase mi cuerpo para ser quemado, 
y no tengo amor, de nada me sirve. El amor es sufrido, es benigno. El amor no tiene envidia, el amor no es jactancioso, no se envanece. No hace nada indebido, no busca lo suyo. No se irrita, no guarda rencor. No se goza de la injusticia, mas se goza de la verdad. Todo lo sufre, todo lo cree, todo lo espera, todo lo soporta. El amor nunca deja de ser, pero las profecías se acabarán y cesarán las lenguas y la ciencia acabará. ¿Por qué en parte conocemos y en parte profetizamos? Más cuando venga lo perfecto, entonces lo que es en parte se acabará. Cuando yo era niño, hablaba como niño, pensaba como niño, juzgaba como niño. Más cuando ya fui hombre, dejé lo que era de niño. Ahora vemos por espejo, oscuramente, más entonces veremos cara a cara. Ahora conozco en parte, pero entonces conoceré como fui conocido. Y ahora permanecen la fe, la esperanza y el amor. Estos tres, pero el mayor de ellos es el amor. Good morning. It's great to be in God's house today. We're going to uh, have our children's time, and it's great to see so many kids here with us today. Um, I'm actually going to invite Emery. He doesn't know that I'm doing this, but I'm going to invite Emery to come up because I have a question for him that I'm hoping he can help me with. Come on up. Come on over here, Emery. So for those of you that don't know, this is my youngest child. This is Emery, and I have a question for you, Emery. When I say to you, did you know that I love you? What do you normally say to me? Yes, you always say it. I always say it, don't I? Because I tell you every day is what I normally say, right? That's right. So that's something that Emery and I say all the time. I'll say, Emery, did you know that I love you? And he'll say, yes, you tell me every day. <laughs> so thank you, Emery. You can go sit down. So I have a question for everyone else out there. We'll start with the kids, and if the kids can't come up with answers, then we'll get the adults to help. Who loves you? So Emery already knows that I love him, but who loves you? Go ahead. You can yell it out to me. God, that is such a great answer, and we are going to talk about that in just a minute because you are right. God loves us so, so much. Layla, who else loves you? Jesus, look, man, you guys are too good. You're getting ahead of me. So God loves us, Jesus loves us, our parents love us, our aunts love us, our brothers and sisters, even though sometimes they might not show it, they love us too. Our grandparents, all the people here, our church family, they love us. And most importantly, of course, God and Jesus love us so very much. And there are lots of things in the Bible that tells us about that. Um, you might know John 3.16, for God so loves the world that he gave us his son. Or 1 John is one of my favorites because it actually says that God is love. God is love, so of course he loves us because he is love. One passage of scripture, I've been really loving the Psalms lately, and Psalm 86.15 says, But you, O Lord, are a God of compassion and mercy, slow to slow to get angry and filled with unfailing love and isn't that a beautiful thing that God's love for us will always go on no matter what we do no matter um, where we go that God's love never fails is unfailing so we're going to sing a song um, that says Jesus loves me and for those of you that have never been to camp or have maybe never been here when we've sung it we're going to do it a little bit different so if you can start with doing this with me. And then we're going to sing in just a minute, okay? We'll get this going.
going to sing the Yes, Jesus Loves Me one more time. But I want to, um, Jennifer, if you can go to the second verse there, because I think this is so important. It says, Jesus loves me when I'm good, and I know all of you are so, so good. But it also says that when we make mistakes, when we're bad sometimes, when we maybe don't listen to our parents, or we fight with our brother and sister, it doesn't matter because Jesus loves it. It doesn't mean you should do those things. But it does mean that Jesus loves us even when we make mistakes. So I want you to really remember that this week. We're going to sing this second verse and uh, the chorus one more time. And then I'm going to pray for the kids before they go to Sunday school. All right, so let's get our rhythm going again. God, we thank you so much for our kids. We thank you for the fact that they love us and that kids show um, unconditional love, but we also thank you for your unconditional love, God. We thank you that no matter what we do, whether or not we um, are listening to our parents or we're listening to you or we're following you or if we mess up sometimes that you love us so much, God, I thank you for our kids. I thank you for the joy they bring into our lives. I thank you for um, the love that our church family has for them. I pray that as they grow, they will turn to you. They will see your unfailing love for each and every one of them. God, your love is so big. It's so great. And it's never failing. And we thank you for that love. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So kids, you're going to meet uh, Sip Away upstairs. Nunto is waiting at the back for you. And uh, she'll bring you up there. Have the best time at Sunday school. Learn lots. And uh, we'll see you after. What a great reminder that Jesus loves us when we're good and when we're bad. We're going to sing a song before the message, uh, the song Above All Powers, Above All Kings, Above All Nature, and Above All Created Things, Above All Wisdom, and All the Ways of Men. You were here before the world began. Jesus, you were here. God, you were here. Let's stand together as we sing this song straight through with the help of the band. <laughs> Oh, 
Dear God, we thank you for today, and uh, we thank you for the blessing that this service has already been, that we've been able to feel your Holy Spirit, that we can uh, come together with like-minded people, people that um, believe in you, that trust in you, that love you, that have received your love. God, I thank you for each individual person here, and we thank you for technology even when it fails us. We thank you that um, we can go into people's living rooms and cottages and cars, wherever people might be tuning in, and uh, they can tune in as well. We pray that the issue will be resolved and that we can listen to your word. Uh, God, we thank you for this morning. We thank you for who you are. And uh, we thank you for being with us this morning. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Excellent. Enjoy the message. So we're going to continue in our sermon series, Fresh Fruit, and we're going to look at, uh, over the next nine weeks, the fruits of the Spirit that are listed off in Galatians 5 and 22. And those fruit are love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. And Paul says in those words, against such things there is no law. And we're going to look at each of those fruit in detail and figure out how our world can be impacted when we have evidence of them in our life. And this morning we begin with, we, we're going to begin, obviously, with the first one on the list. The one that Paul, in our passage from 1 Corinthians 13 and 13, would say is the greatest of all. The one that Colleen mentioned a few moments ago, the Apostle John said, is the very nature of God in 1 John 4, 7 and 8. The one that's mentioned over 540 times throughout the 66 books of the Bible and defines the entire story from in the beginning of Genesis 1 and 1 to amen of Revelation 22 and 21. A word that has been the basis or in the title for more than 100 million songs, it's estimated and 5,700 movies, a word we use to try to describe a feeling that we have for our spouse or our kids, our parents, or the special people in our lives, that word that sometimes we struggle to say to a partner or someone who we have feelings for, uh, despite knowing it's true because of the fear that we might not hear it back from them when we say it. I, as a 13-year-old, apparently didn't have that fear, as Colleen can attest, because I said it to her within two weeks of us beginning to date when we were young uh, and in love. And while it has that powerful of a meaning that we remember it now two times that many years later, it's also a word that has been watered down in our society, used to describe how we feel about someone's outfit or a flavor of ice cream or one of those songs or movies I mentioned ago that we, we love them. As you will no doubt have figured out already, we're going to begin this portion of the series by looking at love. Love that, the first, that is the first fruit listed in the, of the fruit of the Spirit. The first thing we see evident, evidence of in our lives when we become a new creation in Christ. It's the first because it's the fuel that provides the opportunity to see the others in our lives as well. Joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control, all of those things are only possible because of love, because of God's love, because God is love, and because his love becomes a key in our lives. And to learn what love can do and look like in our lives, we turn to perhaps the most famous collection of love verses from the Bible. We turn this morning to the love chapter of 1 Corinthians chapter 13. Words that we have heard probably so many times during our lives that we could almost repeat them from memory. Words chosen a lot at people's weddings to symbolize the love that those two people have for one another. And yet as I did some study this week into this passage, this was not the original intent for Paul when he wrote these words to the church in Corinth. This was a church, as we heard a few weeks ago, that Paul had set up and was now writing to address 
a number of topics that had led to divisions and quarrels among the people. Sexual immorality and lawsuits brought up against one another. Issues between the married and the single people. Order in worship, the right use of spiritual gifts, the order of spiritual gifts, and freedom in Christ. And so over the first 12 chapters of the, of the book, Paul has shared about these issues. And in particular, he's addressed the issue of spiritual gifts in chapter 12, which comes just before our passage. He shared with them the truth that no gift is more important than any other, that all are needed in order to be one united body in Christ. So whether they were a hand or a foot, an eye or an ear, a prophet or a teacher or a miracle worker or something else that each was needed and each would find their place of prominence within the church family, within the body of Christ at different times. That they had to let this, uh, they had let this lead to squabbling, but he was going to show them a more excellent way as he writes, as he, and he finishes in 1 Corinthians 12 and 31. And so it's directly following this that we get the love chapter, a response to the infighting about spiritual gifts. As I read this week, this passage was less of a description about marital or relational love as, it was re- uh, as we read it now. And really it was more about throwing shade or calling out the Corinthians for what they were doing. Paul was saying, you call yourselves a church, a family. You say you're followers of Jesus. You tell us that you're full of God's love, but your actions are anything but. Love does this and you don't. Love doesn't do this and you do. Paul is using the powerful description of God's earth shattering love to contrast their actions showing them how worldly living and thinking had started to take over their church. And we see this in the first three verses of this passage. And he writes, If I speak in the tongues of men or of angels, but do not have love, I am only a resounding gong or a clanging cymbal. This is when I should have got Jacob to smash a cymbal or hit a gong or something. There we go. We got it. That's what you sound like. If I have the gift of prophecy... And can fathom all mysteries and all knowledge if I have a faith that can move mountains but do not have love, I am nothing. If I give all I possess to the poor and I give over my body to hardship that I may boast, you do not, and you, uh, but you do not have love, I gain nothing. Paul is building on what he had just been saying to them over those previous 12 chapters, telling them that all the greatest gifts they can receive or give in this world mean nothing if love is not the driving force behind it. If they're not living or doing it for the right reasons. He's saying if they were a, uh, if they were a terrible person, if they weren't someone who, play, who people wanted to be around, If they weren't doing it all fueled by love, then it's nothing. He's telling these people, you can speak every language of the earth. You can even speak in heavenly tongues. That's amazing. But if no one can stand to listen to you because of how self-centered or angry or hypocritical you are, all of those words mean nothing. You're the most giving person with your possessions. That's great. But if you're only doing it for fame or to make yourself look better or to have one up on someone else, those things mean nothing. You can use your amazing gifts from God, but while you do it, you're bragging. You're doing it for your own glory or you're putting others down because they don't have the same gift. You're just making noise. You're a gong or a cymbal. But he doesn't stop there because if you're gossiping about others and keeping track of the ways that they're not living up to the standards that you've set for them, you're only really telling on yourself, he's saying. If you're viewing this Christian life as a competition, trying to one-up the people around you, you're losing out on being selfless and humble like Jesus. 
If you're living your life jealous of the gifts of others or the things they've accumulated, you're missing the opportunity to see and use the blessings that God has given you. Paul's saying if you're doing any of those things, and then he lays this out in verses 4 to 8, that God's love is not guiding you. Paul's taking all the worldly things that, they, that had infiltrated their church, all the worldly things that are still a problem at times in our church, in our lives, in our Christian journey, and calling them for what they are. Not Christ-like, not godly, not loving. That a life lived only focused on self is a life lived in direct opposition to what God wants for them and wants for us. A life lived in, through, and displaying His love. One that doesn't only look out for ourselves, doesn't stand in judgment of others for the life they're living, doesn't suppress the rights of women and children, our neighbors, doesn't abuse the power and privilege it's been given. Because a life lived in love, a life lived in the evidence of the fruit of the Spirit is something much more. It's the model we see, we read about in the Gospels in the life of Jesus. It's life lived the way Paul described him in Philippians 2, 1-8. And Paul wrote, So if there is any encouragement in Christ, any comfort from love, any participation in the Spirit, any affection and sympathy... Complete my joy by being of the same mind, having the same love. Being in full accord and of one mind, do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility count others more significant than yourselves. Let each of you look not only to his own interests, but also to the interests of others. Have this mind among yourselves, which, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself, took the form of a servant, was born in the likeness of men. And being formed in human for found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. A life lived in the evidence of the fruit of the spirit of love would be one like that. And while in 1 Corinthians 13, Paul does this amazing job of listing what that looks like by contrasting what love isn't with what love is, we're going to focus solely for the rest of this message on what love is, because I believe it's easier than, or it will help us to see what we're striving for. Because being like Jesus, living a life of hope, we, means we become completely changed from our selfish human condition, from the ways of the world. When we're full of the fruit of the Spirit, we become patient and kind with others, including those we just can't understand or who get on our nerves. We become generous, humble, honorable, and selfless in how we use our, our uh, resources and how we treat other people. When love is, the, is evidenced in our lives, we become peaceful and honest, protective and trusting, hopeful and persevering. Now this isn't to say that we just blindly believe everything or trust everyone no matter what. But it means that we will be able to stop just or mainly seeing the bad in the world, the bad in others. We'll stop seeing people for the worst things they have done. We'll stop looking at them with our flawed human vision, but see them through heavenly eyes. We'll see people as God does. Not for who they are, but for who they can be in and through his love. Not trying to change people to make them who we want them to be, but changing our perspective so we can be used by God to show a better way to live in love. Paul was writing this portion of his letter as a wake-up call to a people in a time much different from ours and yet so much like ours. He wrote it to them never thinking that we would be spending this time today 
to read it, to study it, to learn from his writings. But there is so much that we can take from Paul today. Because much of what they were struggling in their ancient culture is still around in our modern world. There are still examples of it in the church, at times in this church. We see it in others, and if we're being honest, when we look in that reflection of ourselves in the mirror, we see it in us at times too. But Paul's saying, I'm showing you a better way. Jesus lived out the perfect way. The Holy Spirit will give us the fruit of love in our lives when we accept Jesus into it and seek to live his way over our own. And living this way will allow us to live a better, more perfect, more Christ-like way. And how will we know we're on the right track? That we have evidence of God's love in our lives? Because we will have peace and patience in our dealings with other people. Not just those who look like us or who are like us or who we like, but those who don't believe what we do. Who struggle to understand why we would follow a God who allows such bad things to happen. Who people who want to see, who we want to see come to faith, but who are unable to see how they are living a life outside of the will of God. We'll have that peace and patience that will allow us to live out the words of Reverend Billy King when he said, it's God's job to judge. It's the Holy Spirit's job to convict. It's my job to love. On top of that, when we're showing evidence of God's love in our, love in our lives, we will find kindness in our hearts. Kindness for those who want nothing more than to hurt us or to see bad things happen to us. We'll find joy in every situation and circumstance. Whether we have a lot or a little, being happy in the successes of others and remaining humble in our own, knowing that all we have is a blessing for the one who gave it to us. When we have evidence of love in our lives, we will also find opportunities to be selfless and sacrificial in our relationships with others and in how we use our time, our talents, and our treasures. We'll take opportunities to be in ministry for him through volunteering here at the Citadel or finding ways to be his hands and his feet in the communities where we live, where we work, where we go to school, where we find ourselves. When we have evidence of his love, we will use the power and privilege we have. Things we've gained because of position or prominence, financial affluence, because of where we were born, the language we speak, our gender, our age, or our race, not for our own benefit, but to bring about true equality for all people, to speak up for or enhance the voices that are being unheard, to fight for the rights of those in minority positions or who are being oppressed. When his true love is in our lives, it will make us an inclusive people, who don't look down on or push aside, reject or exclude anyone, regardless of their race, their religion, their language, their status, their gender, their identity, their sexual orientation, or any other thing that has been used to divide us. We will find the strength, the hope, and the perseverance to trust in God. To trust in his plans for our lives where there seems to be no hope in our circumstances. We'll find hope in our struggles with our status here in the country, the political climate of the day, the challenges with finding work or trying to repair a broken relationship, challenges that come to us when we receive a troubling diagnosis, are waiting for results on health concerns or see a loved one slipping away as they deal with illness. We'll find faith in the challenges in communicating with our neighbors, co-workers, family, friends, and others as we try to share with them the good news of what we know about Jesus. When you and I are living a life empowered by the fruit of the spirit of love, Paul tells us we will be able to put away childish responses, 
reactions and reasonings that get in the way of our relationships, our growth, and our witness to the world. That in being filled with love, we will see evidence of the other fruit as they feed on the power of God's love that is the fuel of our lives. That we will be a changed people. People changed for the better because his love wills us to it. A love that is contrary to our nature. A love that is contrary to our world. A love that, as Paul said, when all is taken away, when all is gone, this will still remain. The greatest of it will be love. Would you join me in prayer? Father, we bow in these moments thankful for your love. Your love that was evidenced from the beginning of time. Your love that was evidenced as we've read through these scriptures in the relationships that you had with your people. Your love that was perfectly displayed on the cross. As Jesus spread his arms wide open, took on our sins so that your love could win. Father, my prayer this morning is that we would be a people of love. Love for you, love from you. Love for others. That we would find kindness and peace. That we would be selfless and sacrificial. That when people see us, they would see the evidence of your love in our lives. Father, as we look around at the world that we live in, we see so much darkness and hate and division. At times we see it coming from your church. May we be a people of love opening our doors, opening our hearts to the world, to draw in your sons and daughters, to remind them that you love them. Burden us with the things that break your heart, Father. Pour your love into us so it overflows out into Villamard, into the other boroughs of Montreal where we find ourselves during the week into this province, this country, and around the world. May we be a people of your unconditional, unending, world-changing love. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. I'm going to ask the band to uh, prepare to play through our reflection song uh, over the next few moments. It says, He giveth more grace. As our burdens grow greater, he sendeth more, sendeth more strength as our labors increase. To added afflictions, he adds his mercy. To multiplied trials, he multiplies peace. This is what his love can do in our lives. This is what his love can bring us through. This is that same love that we then need to share with each other, with others, with the world. The truth that God is there, that God is love. Perhaps this morning you don't know that love. Whether you're listening in this room or you're watching online, you, you, you don't know that love. You haven't experienced that love. Well, God wants to share that love with you. We would love to share that love with you as well. Take these moments to ask God to just pour his love out on you. Perhaps the issue is some of that worldly thinking has started to come in. We've become envious or boastful, proud. We've used our gifts for the wrong reasons. We've kept records of wrongs on other people. We haven't been patient. Perhaps this morning what we need to ask God for is a refilling of his love so that we can be more patient and kind, selfless and sacrificial. Or perhaps this morning it's just prayers of thanksgiving that you want to offer him for his love that he didn't leave us in his sin in our sin sorry that he didn't leave us alone 
that the Holy Spirit is here. That through the Holy Spirit we can be His love into the world. Take these moments as we sing through these words to allow them to settle in, to reflect on them, to reflect on what you've heard, to respond as the Holy Spirit is leading this morning. To come to this place of prayer if if that's where you need to come. To pray where you are, to pray at home, to write it in the chat. But to put the, uh, the wheels in motion, to start things moving forward, to be a more loving person, more loving example, to thank God for His love today. We're going to be led by the band as we sing down this hymn together. Respond as the Spirit leads you today uh, in God's love. Father, we thank you that you're a God that gives. That you gave us your one and only Son. That Jesus, you showed us a more excellent way to live. And Holy Spirit, that you have remained here to guide us. To challenge us, to burden us, to be more like Jesus. To be more Christ-like to be more godly, to be more loving. Father, my prayer for us, for my brothers and sisters, for myself, for us as a church family here at Montreal Citadel is that we would be an embodiment of your love, a love that would overflow from us to the world around us. The people couldn't help but be changed because your love is that powerful. 
The light is that bright that shines out of us, out of this space. That, Father, as we meet during the week to hand out food, that it wouldn't just be food that goes out, but your love. That as we go to our work or to our school, as we sit at our desk or we work on our work site, that it wouldn't just be us that's there, but your love would be there, evident for everyone around us. That as we go and get our groceries, or we take our kids to the park, or we do all of the other things that we do throughout our week, that people would see your love feel your love all around them what this world needs god is your love for more people like us to be your love for others and to others bless us in these moments bless the time that we will share after this service bless our friends that join us our brothers and sisters that join us online bless the time that we will spend out on the street Yes, it'll be setting up a bouncy castle, but it will be sharing your love through conversation, through music, and in so many other ways. In Jesus' precious name I pray. Amen. Let's stand together for a closing song. And the words shine, Jesus shine, fill this land with the Father's glory. Blaze, spirit, blaze, set our hearts on fire, flow, river, flow. Flood the nations with grace and mercy. Send forth your word, Lord, and let there be light.
Amen. And I pray that whatever we find ourselves doing this week, that the love of Jesus, the light of Jesus would shine in and through us to all those that we would meet. Our um, scripture benediction is found in 2 Corinthians chapter 13, verses 11, verse 11. Finally, brothers and sisters, goodbye. Aim for per perfection. Listen to my appeal. Be of one mind. Live in peace. And the God of love and the peace be with you all. May the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all now and forevermore. Amen. Have a blessed week.